Okay, so welcome to everybody. It's very nice to see all of you um, in room nine of the National Gallery. Um, we are going to just head over to this painting first of all, and we will begin here if that's okay. Crowd into the corner, everybody, as you're used to doing. Okay, so I'm going to just give you a brief um, introduction to the paintings um, themselves, and then I will um, delightedly hand over to our poets um, for this evening to give you their response um, to the paintings here in the National Gallery. And um, before we start, are anyone, is anyone here first time visitors to the gallery? Or are you all very, open? okay, fantastic. What are your thoughts so far? Marvellous, okay, we will only get better, so fantastic, brilliant. Everyone else is um, very familiar. So, are we just going to look at this painting here? How many of you recognise this painting, know this painting at all? Um, it's quite a... Um, striking work and actually I think one that you need to look at um, on more than one occasion to really get an idea of, of what's happening. Um, it's very explicit sexually as well and there's almost this kind of unravelling of, of what the artist Bronzino is trying to convey to us, the viewer. So just over on this part of the work we see Venus, the goddess of love and beauty, and um, being kissed, just about to be kissed on the lips by her son, Cupid. Um, and he is just, you know, fondling her nipple there. So this really is about this idea of um, unchaste relationships. We're looking, if we look down the bottom here, we have the masks, um, thinking about um, fidelity, adultery, etc. Um, and then just behind our figures here, we have this figure that's showing us this idea, the allegory of pleasure, perhaps. He's smiling and um, he's holding those petals on his, in his hands and he's about to throw them down on them. And you can see just behind this kind of head and figure, she's holding some honeycomb um, to give to perhaps our figures here. But if you look, her, her, her body is that of a, some kind of reptile, of an animal, and so all is not well. And then just behind Cupid, um, we have this, um, this figure here, this allegory perhaps of, of jealousy and syphilis. Um, this painting, we, we think, was perhaps um, commissioned for the King, King of France, um, Francis the King of France. Um, he was known to be a particularly lecherous man. Um, and this idea of syphilis as well, it was known as the French disease. Um, and the, um, the French troops bringing it to, to Italy. So there's many things going on with Any this Any French painting. people in the audience? Sorry, it's not just... You know, I'm just telling it as it is. There is no, um, this, is, uh, this is not my, this is not my particular opinion. This is just in terms of an art historical um, Could you qualify inf that? information. Yes, yes no. I can. Any French um, people, it's not the owner's opinion. Yes, do not <laughs> Um, so, <laughs> and then just in, in the top corners there, you can see this, this figure, this bearded figure. This is the allegory of time. And just this almost, you can't really see their face. This is oblivion. And time is, is, is trying to stop oblivion um, from showing um, Cupid and Venus just here. These figures are, we would call this a very mannerist style of painting. Um, it's almost very artificial, isn't it? This kind of artificial elegance to the figures. Very light, very stark. Almost the lighting feels as if we're sitting in a dentist or something. That very stark, um, stark idea. So there's something very cold about this painting as well. But we can also think about poetry when we think about this painting. The artist was a poet and really made for the, the viewer to be trying to unravel a feast for the eye, but also for the brain, the mind, and the intellect. So on that note, I'm going to hand over to Amazing. our poet. Yeah. So, Thank you, sir. How can I follow that? I won't even try. I want it to be known that we, the poets, had full freedom in choosing the paintings. <laughs> I chose this. <laughs> this is the painting I felt like I must write upon. And yes, Fiona, you know, when I first saw it, I thought, this is what my dentist is like. <laughs> An allegory with Venus and Cupid by Bronzino. 
The nipple is driest when we do thirst. I am a qualified pet therapist, so I can explain this scene to you. It's called symbolism. When you search for an image you do not understand, when you gaze upon a painting that Google blurs. This painting is asking, are you interested? Venus is revenge. Cupid offers support without gaps, with good cupping. This painting is declaring desires are happy lies, as you all know when you're finished. I am a beast man with more lust than is normal for my people. I am mythic, shaking my maracas seen right. <laughs> I am an orange globe that is not an orange resting in a sweaty palm. I am disappearing behind love's back. Cupid's teeth are melodies. They are teeth that files other teeth. Venus's moisture is God's sweat. But which God? Bronzino's, the breasts, the teeth that suffers, the, te the technique, the upper middle index finger above, the middle finger below, between sensation, like a pancake. <laughs> After all, the eye is a nipple, if it is blinking, and a tangle of moral messages are in themselves a message. The message is that things get complicated, but come on, all the same, nonetheless, don't kiss your son, don't break a child's arrow, don't steal your mum's crown, don't thrust your buttocks provocatively. <laughs> Simply bend at the knee and stretch and present with respect and <laughs> grace. Fraud, folly, pleasure, money, time, oblivion, reveal or conceal, tell people or keep counsel. It doesn't matter when the family gets together. <laughs> Whatever it is you'll do on the way home, know this. As the symbols here reveal, you have to be in it to win it. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to head just there, just to the painting, just before the um, the uh, archway there, um, in front of the origins of the Milky Way. So if we make this right here. Here. Please, crowd around, come close. Breathing distance is fine. It's very polite here, no one will mention anything. Come, come. Okay, that's fantastic. Okay, so before I hand over to Abby Snappy, who is going to um, read her poem, and she's written a response to this. Let's just have a bit of information about this painting um, here. So again, thinking about this idea of perhaps myth, and perhaps thinking about allegorical themes as well. Um, and looking at the naked breasts here of, of Juno. And when we look, we see Juno here, but we also see the attributes of the peacock. So thinking of the idea of um, the goddess Juno and the peacocks. And then just above her is her husband Jupiter, who is swooping down to place his his son, not her son, his son, onto her breast because his mother was immortal. And of course, Jupiter wants his son to live forever. And so he's trying to, to get him to suckle on the milk of Juno. And as he does, she awakens and she's startled. And as she's startled, the milk from her breast is taken up into the heavens. And this they say is the origins of the Milky Way. Um, and we know that the, that the artist himself, um, Tintoretto, may well have had um, knowledge of a previous um, idea of this story. And it was said that when the milk from Juno um, was taken from her breast, it fell down to the earth. And this, as well as being the origins of the Milky Way, is also the origins of the white lily flower. Wow. The painting itself is, has been cut down and lost, so actually there's huge swathes of the bottom of the painting that we no longer have. But we know that there is a copy of the original of this painting, and down at the bottom of this painting um, was a figure who was personifying the earth and personifying Jupiter and Juno 
themselves. So if you look closely at this work as well, you can see Jupiter, his attribute, we might associate him with the eagle there. And then this array of colours that you see, this is a very vibrant painting itself. So either side of this wall here, we have these two figures alluding to, as I said, allegory and Sophia Kamal, everybody! Prophecy termed delicacy, a means to keep the structure of being savoured in hopes of cementing the throne, overthrown by an apple falling from a tree, finding cranial roots and tortured by destiny, broken teeth or bones or innards, twisting guttural, the consequence of a mortal toil sourced from Earth's soil. A cliché likened to a sad spillage delivered by a rock turned gold. A deception of mortal perception procured by the protector. A primordial ocean likened to ink from a quill, born from a shifting shape and destined to succumb to the winged messenger, to shed the nape of which mortal snakes coil wrestled with the gold of man spoiled by the breaking cosmos. Of that same deception was born a conglomerate of possibilities, now observed primarily through plasma, desperation encapsulated and returned to one, belonging to all and none. Fold and yield, the sacred bird of witness to an astral awakening, spanning the breadth of an omnipotent breath, draped in primary lava, a strategic sidewind threatens interim dormancy, the effect of which a nullified negligence, designed with elegance. Juno, painting the black canvas of the night with primordial juice, a woman, the creator, in myth and in nature, a beautiful failure of man's deception, thwarted, replaced by divine creation, Fiona will once again introduce, well, following Fiona's introduction, the legendary Andrew Cotting will be reading. So before we hand over to Andrew for his response uh, to this particular painting, I just want you to um, cast your eyes onto this. Um, this is actually a fragment of a work. Um, this would have been known as a, a tondo, so that it would have been a ceiling decoration. So we would have been quite literally looking up towards it. And I'm very intrigued as to what the, the female figure might be saying um, to this man here, if we could kind of have a, a little speech bubble or imagine what is being said. Is she speaking? Is she singing? And um, what's going, going on there? Possibly the man was known. Um, he was part of the, the court to Alfonso d'Este, um, the Duke of Ferrara, um, and this ceiling decoration would have been made um, for, for the palace there. They're both wearing an array of jasmine um, in, in their hair there as well. And they look very, very close. The figures that you would normally see in these ceiling decorations as well would be household characters, so people <coughs> in the house, and there would normally be something very humorous about it. But all kind of idea of what the purpose of this was, what the meaning of this was, has been lost. And so ultimately, it's for us to look at it now and make our own decisions. And on that note, I'll let Andrew give you his response. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to uh, indulge some um, confabulation. I'm going to give you some speech bubbles for both of these characters, but it must at first be uh, remembered that it's not Jasmine, it's Hemlock. <laughs> so bear that in mind. A man embracing a woman by do, -si -do. Or is it? 
It must be noted that all knowledge of the original meaning of the painting has been lost. So, this by way of a riposte. Is this, his sly distant gaze, a predominant bid for attention? A meditation, a contemplation. Perhaps it is disarmingly simple. He takes conventional wisdom about life and mixes it all up into an incredible befuddle. Seduction no longer on the menu. Come here, my dear, and I will make you mine. He is convinced that she has been besotted by him. The wind blows hard in his neck of the woods, and he's not about to let go. No, possession is his ambition. Surreptitious advances weigh heavy on her shoulder. And as she struggles, he becomes bolder. There he is, pulling her towards him. He supposes ecstatic glances. Hers more cry of agony. This his meaning, as a relentless succession of moments during which he might confront the experience of meaningless itself. His life force channeled into those magnificent sideburns. Inglebert Humperdinck would have been proud of them, but more of that later. It's all about him. Or is it? There she is, dreaming of his embrace. I think not. The skies have become queen. It is no mystery. She knows her way from here. And there is in his hair is the small sprig of her ambition. Hemlock. Realised the night before, his expression now mummified. Rigor mortis has set in, awash with formaldehyde. Her ecstasy now revealing the fact of his supposed suicide and the revelation that she was not besotted by him. The wind no longer blows hard in his neck of the woods. His attempted possession fell on unwanted loins. So there he is. She is, they are, above them, the earth below, in all of its glorious misunderstanding. Buffalo girls go round the outside, round the outside, round the outside. Buffalo girls go round the outside, do see do your partner. <laughs> Not what you're expecting, but better. Yeah. Yeah, good. <laughs> okay. Yes. That's what we like to hear. Um, so for our second um, work in here, again, those of you, so gather round, everybody. Gather round. Um, move this way, just so we're not in front of the, uh, in front of the doorway. Um, excellent. So for this second work um, in, in this room, those of you that are familiar with the gallery may well have noticed this painting. Um, this was very popular um, during this period. This is the, the kind of late um, 1400s, and this idea of trying to capture um, figures in the art of singing, music making. And um, we see just these three figures here. Possibly this idea of a, a piece of music for it, a tenor, a soprano, and then also we've got the lute here. If you look at the lute itself in terms of the instrument, you can see this very ornately carved um, embellishment here, this kind of flower embellishment here. And then just underneath, we have these much smaller instruments here. It looks a little bit like a, a violin called a rebec. And then we have the recorder just at the top. But the purpose of the instruments here is not just to show us the music that's on display, um, but also really just to give us this idea of the depth of the ledge in which they are possibly tapping their fingers in time to the music. So if you will, just imagine the sounds that we could perhaps hear emanating um, from the work here, if we, if we could. 
Um, she looks as if she's very much in control of what she's doing here, as does the man in the centre. Perhaps he's either looking out towards us or perhaps about to look at the musical notation just below on the ledge. But it's the man here that um, not quite sure about what might be happening. And he looks a little bit as if he's trying to keep in tune and maybe perhaps trying to keep in time to them. So in terms of who this might have been made for, um, who would have been viewing, viewing this particular painting, as we said, this was a very popular type of theme um, to have for patrons. And, and really thinking about this idea of, of music making and the joy of the performance that it can bring. So on that note, I will hand over to our esteemed poet Dan Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm about to provide the music uh, for this, uh, the release, <clears throat> which you can almost see the character on the right hand side is about to undo his doublet, I think, but I won't talk about that. The release, thus, here we have it, a picture made to entertain the educated, the wealthy, the popperatory, post-gentrification, now the new ladyfication. Thus, there he is in the middle. He's all a muddle. Is it her he still fancies? Or is it him he fancies? Or is it them just fancying the fact that they all fancy each other? <laughs> or is it that the moment has got the better of him? And that he's all a dither with the strings of his guitar? Whilst behind him, the other him is all fiddlesmith with the buttons of his tunic. <laughs> Either way, no matter the matter, it is always what matters that matters. It's what counts, not the picture, not speaking the way one yawns, not thinking by rote, spawning nothing of note, save the long breath of weight, where nothing holds, and everything is about that frozen stanza of time, lost in the conjecture of what might happen next. What has happened? What might have been? The not knowing, the kowtowing of fate. That was then, this is now. And the gentrifiers have been ousted by the ladyfiers. Oh, to be able to give off a whiff of their enigma. Oh, to have been implicated in something outstanding and spectacular. The beckoning, the power of the gaze, the conjecture. This is not Hark the Herald Angel Sing. This is an arm on a shoulder and a hand on a loin. But this might also be, please release me <laughs> and let me go. For I do not love you anymore. To waste our lives would be a sin. So, release me and let me love again. I have found a new love, dear, and I will always want him near. His lips are warm while yours are cold. So, release me and let me love again. I have found a new love, dear, and I will always want him near. His lips are warm while yours are cold. So release me and let me love again. To waste a life would be a sin. So release me and let me love again. Please release me, let me go. For I, the end. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Fiona once again! <laughs> Two more, unfortunately, only two more. It's sad. Um, homes. It's sad, isn't it? it is it's sad. sad. I think people are really enjoying themselves. It's, there's something very joyous um, about the spoken word and about these particular responses to the painting. So, thank you oh, um, very much indeed. It's been fantastic. Um, so, before I hand over to um, Marcio, I am going to just give you a little bit of information about this um, painting here. 
Um, this is a very small work, isn't it? Very, very small. And again, I'm not sure um, how many of you who are familiar to the gallery perhaps have stopped to look at this work at all or noticed it. But this is this idea of the combat of love and chastity. So the idea of suppressing illicit love and chastity over overruling it. Um, and this idea of fidelity and, and faithfulness. And particularly at this period of time when this work was made, um, really putting that message across to women, um, young women who are about to be, be married. And um, we might also um, think about this work here, but also if you just look to this work here, um, and this is this idea of this is Venus and Mars, again, a, an illicit relationship seen as a warning as what can happen. Um, and both of these works were probably made um, to be in walls, so the kind of panelling of a wall in the um, Camara Bella, the most beautiful room in the house, and normally as a wedding present, um, and possibly put into the, the palace of the groom's house. And um, so imagine having these on your, you know, in the wall, um, in, in your room. So we have this idea um, of, of love just here. We have chastity with her shield. And if you look very closely, you can kind of see the chain just above her. And she's fending off that arrow there. And this was inspired um, by poems, um, the triumph of poems, and this idea where... Um, Love is, 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 is in this kind of chariot with all of the people who've succumbed to illicit love and comes across chastity. And of course, the battle ensues. She is the, she is the victor. And so as a punishment, her, her women around her, they pluck the feathers from his wings. And then they are driven to her temple where she lays a wreath of victory to show who is the victor. So whether this was inspired from those particular poems, and that I think is very apt for our evening. So on that note, I will hand over to you, Marcia, for your response. Marcia Knight Latter. Um, so as Fiona said, yeah, this was by, based on a specific triumph poem, The Triumph of Chastity. Um, if anyone wants to have a quick, a bit small, quick closer look, feel free. <laughs> No shame. <laughs> it's my mother later in the day. Yeah, a bit loud one. Call me that. Uh, right. Show me what I'm free to be. You are love. I am chastity. You are encouraged to attack. My duty is to defend. First, there are no victims here. Burn me if you wish, I'll be to blame. Your taunting game, it stays the same. I do not choose to carry these chains. I'm simply trying to give them back. Don't you think they cause me pain? You get wings, yet where are mine? Every part of you can fly, while well, even my waist and my hair is tied. I want to see my surroundings from new heights. Watch the swans from the sky. He gives chase, she doesn't fight. You bear the weight of your arrows and bow, but I know the eyes of every thought behind the idea that I am not my own. For you, someone seems so. Your caged captives of lust overflow. So I will wave my chains and bind your bones. I will weaponize my constraints, tear feathers from your wings, make heart strings and Seeing your defeat from my chariot, show you how it feels to be pulled through the streets in shame. Flaunt your orange grey when it's been dragged through the dirt of the day. And when you wonder why I won, remember, like the flowers, you called me wild and then tried to tame my nature.
So we're going to just go through back through the uh, archway there and then just turn left um, for our final final work. And now Fiona will introduce this hipster. <laughs> um, okay, so last um, painting um, of the evening before I hand back to Stephen for the final poem. So again, just to say thank you to everybody. Um, so looking at this portrait here, he's kind of just gazing out towards us, it's almost as if we've walked in and caught him in the process of, of reading um, the letter that we see here. Um, it's quite difficult to work out now to ascertain the name um, on the letter and possibly um, the address as well, so you can see just there when the letter would have been folded over, that would have been the name and the address. So he is identified, but there is a date, and it's the 22nd of June, 1518. So possibly this is something very important to this man. Um, he's dressed very elegantly, very richly, and we don't know what his profession would have been, perhaps something of a um, political nature. Um, but we do know that the artist himself in terms of the way that he was painting and the style that he was painting, was actually seen as very radical. This was a very new way of painting. And um, we can see the brush strokes. And actually, if you go closer to the painting um, to look at the face, everything just kind of starts to blur, perhaps, and you have to stand further away to see the details um, on his face. So, who is this man? What did you do? Who knows? Perhaps we never will. But I think for you, looking at him, you can um, put whatever you like onto this painting. Um, but um, maybe a painting that you haven't particularly noticed as you walked through in this room. So I think for you, walking through into room 12, this is an opportunity to look at some of these portraits and try and decide for yourselves who they were and what their lives were. So on that note, for our final poem, I'm going to hand over to the marvellous. Ah. <laughs> it is my opinion that everything you said to describe your painting could be said to describe me. <laughs> I'm a mystery even to myself, Fiona, but let's talk about that afterwards. Portrait of a young man holding a letter by Rosso Fiorentino. Dear Joseph, thank you for your letter. There has been a sale on beans while you've been away. I know you love them as I love you. Blah, blah, blah. No one wants to read your letters, mate. You look confused, and it takes time to read, and that is the one thing we do not have, for we must get on. Oh, look at me. I've got scissors for hands. I drive my van life van down to Montenegro. I drink wine, and only the best mosquitoes bite me. It makes you sick, doesn't it? Look upon this Florentian face. Look at this awful <laughs> person you know from the office. Look at this man that makes the enduring works, the endless youth, the wealthiest fear. Look at this fashion and popular poetry. Look at the knives going chop, chop. Look at the pile of cakes breaking barriers. Look at the lamb chop shoulders. Look at your reality, the man according to the internet, curiosity. I have no beef with Porco Rosso. He paints strange, spiky sponge fingers. My problem is how I have to agree with everything on this face. Why? Why should I? Why must I drink Mother Job's liquid pure? Why must I sacrifice a lamb for the crumpled trout? Why must I chocolate pudding be renamed as the fat man's downfall? <laughs> for all I care, you can keep your dignity and you can wrap it all up in a painting. All I want is for this young man 
to look away. Thank you. This is the last one this year. I want to thank Fiona so much for being so amazing and so supportive. And I also, of course, thank Marcia, Safia, and Andrew. They were amazing. Today.